We start now with the leader of Japan underscoring the importance of the alliance between his nation and the U.S. one day after he and President Biden announced that they are ramping up their military partnership. That's right. And uh, his remarks today come as some lawmakers push for the United States to minimize its role in international affairs. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister of Japan. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida addressed Congress this morning as part of his official state visit to Washington. I'm here to say that Japan is already standing shoulder to shoulder with the United States. You are not alone. We are with you. We have team uh, coverage for this. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian there on Capitol Hill and CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe for us at the White House. Uh, Nicole, I'm going to start with you. Talk to us about how Prime Minister Kishido was received by lawmakers today and the importance of those remarks. Well, the prime minister received a warm welcome, as is customary when a foreign leader addresses Congress. And as many world leaders often do, they try to draw that personal connection uh, to the United States. So we heard the prime minister talk about going to elementary school in Queens for a couple of years, which got a rousing applause and talked about how he used to root for the Yankees and the Mets, which drew a couple of boos. But, you know, <laughs> to take it in stride for Fairweather fans. Um, but, you you know, he did talk about the importance of the U.S.-Japanese alliance when it comes to the economy, when it comes to defense, when it comes to space. But he also uh, made clear uh, that uh, Japan remains in a precarious position, as does the rest of the world, with ongoing global threats, whether that is the situation in China, which he called a great strategic challenge. He also talked about North Korea's provocations, and he talked quite a bit about the war between Russia and Ukraine and re emphasize the importance of supporting Ukraine, talking about what Japan has done, but also the importance of U.S. support as well, which, of course, comes as a critical time as the House in particular considers whether to take up a national security supplemental package. And what's interesting, Nicole, as we switch over to Ed, yesterday during their press conference and their remarks to the public, they made clear that their economic partners, Japan being the number one um, supporter of the U.S.'s economy and vice versa. The area of difference, though, is Japan's Nippon Steel's efforts to buy U.S. steel, which President Biden intervened in and stopped. He doubled down on that yesterday, saying he defends the American worker. But, Ed, the two do need each other. Why are the U.S. and Japan deepening military ties now, despite some areas where there isn't agreement? In a word, Errol, China. The ongoing threats from that country across the Indo-Pacific the aggressive posture it's taken towards Taiwan, which is, of course, near Japan. Uh, that plus just a growing desire for Japan, uh, at least in Kishida's government, to militarize, to expand and, and increase its uh, military presence and military spending and its engagement in foreign affairs. So President Biden and Kishida over the last three years uh, have, have built up that military relationship, especially, and the meetings have resulted in plans for the U.S. and Japan to modernize and uh, essentially buoy the military cooperation, bring it on par with some of the other relationships the United States has with countries like Korea, Germany, uh, and others across the world, uh, and work in concert with other countries in various uh, alliances, like that AUKUS agreement that has the Australians getting nuclear-powered submarines from the United Kingdom and the United States. Japan's going to help develop some technology as well that will be useful to all of them and help pay for things like submarine cables to some far-flung Pacific islands to try to keep those places in this Western orbit, not the Chinese orbit necessarily, in that part of the world. Speaking of orbit, uh, the U.S. wants to help Japan get to the moon and have the first non-American right. uh, to stand on the lunar surface. Nicole, some lawmakers, though, want the U.S. to minimize its role on the global stage. Talk to us about that as far as foreign aid and the extent to which it's impacting the president's agenda. 
Yeah, well, the prime minister also addressed that in his speech pretty clearly, saying that he understands the exhaustion and loneliness that some Americans may feel, but emphasized that the role that the United States plays as a global leader is significant. And again, getting back to Ukraine, he talked about, you know, the lack, if, if U.S. doesn't support uh, Ukraine going forward, what might happen if the U.S. doesn't provide more support in the Indo-Pacific, what might happen and what the repercussions could be for that part of the world. And so what was interesting to note is that that drew applause widely from both sides of the aisle, you know, by those lawmakers realizing the importance of uh, continuing to provide assistance. But at the same time, there were some lawmakers, most notably Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, who remained seated uh, during some of those applause moments. So uh, we know that Greene has been very clear that she doesn't necessarily support moving forward, for instance, with Ukraine aid and is even potentially willing to oust Speaker Johnson over it. All right. Nicole Killian and Ed O'Keefe, thank you. You bet.